Jim Downs is an assistant professor of history at Connecticut College. His teaching and research have been recognized with numerous fellowships. His book manuscript, which is based on a dissertation at Columbia University, is titled Sick from Freedom, The Deadly Consequences of Emancipation. And it will be published in 2012 by Oxford University Press. Greg Downs is an assistant professor of history at City College of New York. He's the author of numerous articles and book reviews, as well as a book of short stories. He was also named a distinguished alumnus of his high school, the University School of Nashville in 2010. His book, Declarations of Dependence, The Long Reconstruction of Popular Politics in the South, 1861 to 1908, was just published by the University of North Carolina Press this, earlier this year. Kadata Williams is an assistant professor of history at Wayne State University. She is also the recipient of numerous, numerous awards, including the prestigious Ford, uh, Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. Her book, They Left Great Marks on Me, African Americans Testimonies About Racial Violence from Emancipation Through the First World War, will be published by NYU Press in 2012. So, Jim. The following, the following requires a bit of an imagination, a willingness to move beyond the scientific nature of historical writing that often requires scholars to punctuate every comment that they make with lengthy footnotes chock full of empirical, empirical evidence. If you're able to push beyond these academic constructs, there's a place. A place that we must imagine because the clues that can lead us there are often few and far between. No, this is not like the story of Hansel and Gretel following the breadcrumbs back to their house. This is a somber effort to acknowledge the sick and the dead. In the millions of documents that chronicle the battles of the Civil War and the coming of Reconstruction, there is not one image of former slaves who were too sick to take part of this revolutionary transformation. In particular, there are no representations of those suffering from a smallpox epidemic, which began in Washington, D.C. in the winter of 1862, spread to the Upper South in 1863, 64, culminated in the Lower South in Mississippi Valley in 1865, and eventually seeped into the Western territories in 1867, 68, infecting Native Americans. There are no references to the effects of an epidemic that left over 100,000 freed slaves dead and infected 10,000 more. Instead, the dominating image of Reconstruction shows how, fought, how hard, shows hard fought political battle, battles won, large groups gathering under a banner of citizenship, and freed women singing liberty. As a result, the experience of the, of, of the afflicted quickly vanished from the post-war landscape and subsequently became erased from the public record. Yet we know that a smallpox epidemic plagued the Reconstruction South, South during this period of so-called liberation, because in the federal buildings that house the million or so documents that detail the post-war world, there are clues. Pieces of scattered evidence referring to the communities of freed people falling victim to what 19th century doctors called, quote, the deadly scourge. There are statements written by concerned teachers about the number of students absent due to the outbreak of smallpox. There are notes written by military officials who at the time of emancipation dismissed the needs of freed slaves who soon realized that the government must do something or, quote, the freed people would go extinct. And there are articles penned by concerned journalists who similarly warned Northern readers that emancipated slaves may soon, quote, <coughs> melt away in freedom. There are also lists compiled by pan panicked physicians who counted the number of freed people whose bodies became devoured by smallpox. Physicians did not record freed people's names or details about their condition. Instead, they reduced their lives to a mere scratch of an ink pen, a mark that served part of, part of a larger calculation to be tallied under the heading number infected. So all of this is to say that the outbreak of smallpox that tore through the post-war South between 62 and 1868 did not by any means go unnoticed. It was documented. But there are virtually no sources that describe what the epidemic meant for freed people during emancipation. All we have is our, <coughs> all we have is our imagination to contemplate their experience. On the federally occupied plantations in the so-called freedom's villages where the federal government boasted about their experiment of free labor, how did free people cope with the outbreak of the epidemic? When did they even recognize that they were infected with what some 19th century doctors referred to as a pestilence? Were they woken at night with a hot sweat and a fever, the first symptoms of a virus? How did they react to the initial signs of, their vi of the virus devouring their bodies when their skin broke and tiny pustules began erupting along their face, arms, and chest? Was this a familiar sight? 
Perhaps they witnessed the effects of smallpox on the body of a friend or a family member on a plantation in which they lived before the war. Or did they see smallpox for the first time during the war among Union troops? We'll actually never know the answer to these questions. To even ask them is to potentially belie the objective of the historian's craft, since there is no mounting heap of evidence that can offer a response to such a long list of inquiries. And it's even more problematic to raise these questions, as they're often my questions, and possibly and probably not even theirs. But raising questions about the bodily manifestations of a disease does in fact matter, given the fact that the term smallpox derives from the Latin word varroa, which means postural or little spots. Smallpox is an illness that is often recognized based on the marks that, that the virus produces on the body. Thus, to ignore the bo bodily manifestations of the virus as a point of reference, or to not even raise it as a valid subject of inquiry, would negate its reality. Freed people, like many other 19th century Americans, may have purposely hidden those infected with smallpox from public view. Like those suffering from leprosy in biblical times, people infected with smallpox may have been ostracized, exiled to the remote corners of a town, forced to live in the remaining parts of their lives in a rural, unknown place. Even if they managed to survive the onslaught of the virus, the scars that would have left on their bodies would, have, would invariably serve as a reminder that they were once carriers of the deadly scourge. Moreover, in 19th century America, any semblance of a past infection of smallpox on one's body would have connoted immorality, poverty, and or sexual licentiousness. All of these reasons would have further marginalized those infected with the virus. Beyond these de, these de facto measures, there was also a public health rationale for these practices as well. Since the 18th century in the United States and even earlier in Europe, townspeople, medical authorities, and municipal officers often quarantined smallpox patients to isolated regions in an effort to prevent the further spread of the virus. Even though medical reasons may have justified isolating afflicted free people to quarantine locations, there were also economic, political, and social pressures that more than likely codified these practices. These pressures may not have been directly articulated or publicly debated, but they were certainly taken in consideration by the freed people and their allies. The, their absence in the archives is not a mere coincidence, but reflective of a larger effort to conceal an episode from history that if fully exposed could have jeopardized the ambivalent hopes of rebuilding a region, a region that we must remember, which before the war, many in the North deemed as backwards and peculiar. Only signs of progress or of hope could be displayed to the rest of the country in order, to, in order for them to agree to economically invest in the South. Only dreams of labor, of free labor and land ownership could be promulgated to apprehensive Northerners and white Southerners whose support of Reconstruction was necessary to achieve national reunion. Consequently, there was no place in the newly built school, school rooms for, children's, for children who could make the others sick. And there was certainly no room in line at the voting booth for those who, whose bodies hinted at a different interpretation of the South. The story of the smallpox episode, in turn, was better off to be pushed aside and eventually forgotten. But all is not entirely lost, as long as we can depend a bit on our imagination. Our imaginations may not be able to reconstruct how individuals, families, or even whole communities wrestled with the explosive outbreak of smallpox, but we can imagine how the conditions that they faced, or at the very, or at the very least, raised questions about their experience. Yet history books cannot be written with a flair for the imagination, as they will be quickly dismissed for not including lengthy footnotes with verifiable evidence. So I have no choice. In order to make sure that the history of the smallpox epidemic among former slaves is not lost, I must, despite my desire to imaginatively reconstruct their experience, play by the rules. If I venture too often to the dangling recess of my imagination, they could be lost again. And this time, it'll be my fault. So I will tell their story as a social history based on clues that I have uncovered in archives across the country. And it goes something like this. The smallpox epidemic began appearing among both Union and Confederate troops as early as 1861 and infected the first group of freed slaves who migrated to Washington, D.C. in the winter of 1862. By early autumn of 1865, the virus had spread beyond the borders of the nation's capital and began appearing in the fir in, first in the Upper South and then in the Carolinas. In North Carolina, smallpox infected well over 300 freed people in one week in 1865. In the Sea Islands, where former Confederate doctors joined the fight joined the fight to stop the spread of the virus. Smallpox killed 800 freed people a week in November and December of 1865. 
Doctors across the South then reported an increase in the number of smallpox cases in their communities. By 1869, the chairman of the Committee of Freedmen's Affairs estimated that smallpox infected 49,000 freed people from June of 1865 to December of 1867. These statistics, however, only tell part of the story. Records of the Bureau of Physicians in the field suggest that the numbers in their specific jurisdiction was in fact much higher. Witnessing the fatalities that smallpox produced, some officers in the field wrote to their supervisors <coughs> with suggestions on how to spread the virus from spreading. A military official in North Carolina in the spring of 65 recommended that a smallpox house resembling the soldier house should be, quote, built for the freedmen to prevent the further spread of the virus. A Union officer stationed in Louisiana, also during the late spring of 65, quote, respectively suggested that an order declaring vaccination to be a military, ne military necessity. The New York Times echoed the need for vaccination in 1866, quote, the Freedmen's Bureau can do as much good in seeing to the vaccination of the blacks as in any other. Unless something is done for them, the Negro population of the South will begin to melt away in freedom, end quote. Despite these warnings, the Freedmen's Bureau did not adequately respond to the outbreak of the virus. Part of the reason why federal authorities did not issue a protocol to handle the virus and failed to perceive smallpox as a problem lies in the statistical reports that the government collected, which suggested that only freed people appeared vulnerable to the virus. The Bureau continually collected monthly and annual reports and mortality rates for former slaves, but did not create a similar system of surveillance for the health of white Southerners. Even though medical officials at the time recognized that smallpox historically crossed racial and class lines, the large number of infected free people and the few, if any, reported cases of infected white people suggested to federal authorities and even to many in the Bureau that smallpox was a virus predominant among only freed slaves. Medical and government authorities thereby understood the increasing number of smallpox and the alleged immor uh, 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 they understood the increasing uh, cases of smallpox as a consequence of, quote, the dirty habits, the alleged immoral behavior of former slaves. They also subscribed to the widely held belief that freed people, like Native Americans, would invariably go extinct if left on their own. Since federal officials anticipated the, ex ex the extinction of the black race, they consequently did not provide bureau doctors in the South with adequate money and resources to build pest houses, to quarantine infected slaves, or to conduct vaccina vaccinations in order to protect freed people from the spread of the virus. Congressman Samuel Cox, a Democrat from Illinois, argued that former slaves were, in quote, dying out. He also compared the high rate of mortality of emancipated slaves to that of Native Americans, and thereby cautioned members of Congress to not violate the Constitution and provide federal assistance to freed people. That said, once congressmen uttered the word extinction and made comparisons to Native American experience, they shifted attention away from the corporal reality of freed people dying, as well as the effects of the epidemic spreading throughout the South. By comparing the high death rates among emancipated slaves to that of Native Americans, these officials began to place more of an emphasis on explaining the epidemic than responding to it, which subsequently morphed this biological crisis into a discourse. By predicting that former slaves would go extinct, they took attention away from the fact that the virus was, was continuing to spread and instead placed their emphasis on explaining the effects of the epidemic. In essence, the discourse of extinction replaced, or at the very least overshadowed, the reality that smallpox continued to infect former slaves. Additionally, the use of the term extinction foreclosed any investigation into the cause or the outbreak of, of uh, into the cause or outbreak of the virus and instead asserted a foregone conclusion about the inevitable demise of former slaves. As the Alabama Independent reported in 1866, unless some organized effort is made to arrest its progress, it will become atmospheric and sweep over the land. In the end, the smallpox epidemic took the lives of thousands of freed slaves when slavery ended and emancipation began. This incident challenges our, this epidemic challenges the story of emancipation as simply a, a triumphant victory for freed slaves. Historians of Reconstruction have often stressed the ability of former slaves to affect the conditions of their freedom, when in fact there were all sorts of an institutional, environmental, and medical constraints that challenged their survival, let alone any meaningful notion of freedom. <clears throat> 
Contemporary historians have also shied away from discussing health conditions of freed slaves for, because they were responding to the medical uh, fiction produced by those who propagated the extinction thesis. Others have been preoccupied with overturning early 20th century characterizations of freed people as inferior and indolent. Yet in their efforts to overturn the image of freed slaves as indolent and diseased, these historians have constructed another image of freed slaves as robust, independent, and devoid of any health problems. Furthermore, if historians drew attention to the sickly and suffering condition of former slaves in the historiography, they risked undermining the emerging image of freed people that began to develop in the 1970s as powerful, independent actors. So as a result, freed slaves, references to freed slaves as sick and dying literally vanished from the histor literally vanished from the historiography, despite the historiographical recognition that the Civil War produced an alarming death rate that wiped out northern and southern infantries. Drawing attention to the smallpox epidemic, therefore, offers a more nuanced understanding of freedom and posits a new direction in the study of Reconstruction. All right, I appreciate you all being here. Um, I'm very excited both about this panel and about the series of panels that have taken place thus far and will continue to take place that relate generally to Reconstruction in the post-war era. And our goal in putting the panel together was, uh, you know, was the goal of many of the other panels that were put together, which was to inspire discussion about where we are, where we're going, and where else we might be going, to sort of try to pull together different strands of the history of the work that's going out there and to assess what that means. In, uh, in that light, I am perhaps foolishly not going to talk about the, the work in the book that just came out, but the early stages of a new project uh, still, in, uh, still in formation, and it's called The Ends of the War, Reconstruction and the Problems of Occupation. In January 1866, Chaplain George Carruthers left the Louisiana Freedmen's Bureau, where he had worked for a few months, to return to his previous posting at the 51st U.S. Colored Infantry. And while scholars have debated the limitations of the Freedmen's Bureau for nearly a century and a half, Carruthers' reasons were not ideological but practical for returning and leaving the Bureau. As the Union's massive demobilization drew troops away from his posting in the Bureau, he wrote, I could do but little good in so delicate a matter as acting next friend to those who had no friends with military support in a bitter, half-conquered, and half-civilized community. Earlier, he had bitterly warned Oberlin students, his alma mater, that free people had no rights away from Union forces, that rights meant something only in relation to efficacy. Back on garrison duty in Alexandria, Louisiana, with the 51st, where his old unit's very presence is a power, Carruthers hadn't given up on Reconstruction, but he had given up on the regions the Army left behind. And a year later, 900 miles away, a North Carolina freedman named Peter Price experienced the same kind of geographical power when he walked 15 miles to plead for help from a Freedmen's Bureau officer. Price had been cheated out of his share of the previous year's crop, and he found an eager listener in Agent Hugo Hillebrand in his third revolution after fighting for Kossuth in his native Hungary, for Garibaldi in Italy, and then coming to the United States to fight for the Union. Hillebrand immediately issued an order demanding that Price's landlord compensate him. But over the 15 miles that Price walked back to the plantation, the order's utility evaporated. The landlord threw the paper on the ground and stomped on it, telling the freedman he would see Hillebrand further in hell than a jaybird could fly before we should have the crop. You might send 10,000 Yankees here, and he would did not intend to be governed by no such laws. As a judge of numbers, the landlord was an exaggerator, but as a judge of power, he was shrewd. Hillebrand had been writing his superiors that he was, in fact, unable to enforce his orders for more than a few mile radius around his office. He didn't need 10,000 men, he thought. He needed 12 in horses. But with one and two, he could only enforce his orders as far as they could walk. Hillebrand, in fact, was so overmatched that he had not been able to retrieve a murdered Union soldier left rotting in the road. Price had then found a sympathetic ear, but what he needed was a powerful hand. While the story of Reconstruction's limitations is a grindingly familiar one, Carruthers and Price's accounts portray Reconstruction in ways that are both somewhat new and then also draw upon previously existing but somewhat submerged notions of scholarship that posit Reconstruction not just as a test of free labor ideology or racism, but a force 
By foregrounding efficacy over intentionality, scholars can ask new questions and revive old questions about the meaning of rights, the mystery of authority, the salience of the state, the practical basis for freed peoples and ex-Confederates organizing, and the relationship between democracy and stability. This also means looking anew at the months after Appomattox as critical moments and to put the Army's withdrawal as a critical turning point in Reconstruction. Thinking about Reconstruction in these terms means again dealing again with the view that had been widely espoused by the Dunning School that Reconstruction was an occupation, while also discounting their assertions of the occupation's malignant efficacy. Revisionist scholars had dismissed that occupation framework because of the evident weakness of Northern control. But with time and perspective, we can see that Reconstruction's limitations were proof not of the absence of occupation, but of problems of occupation. Constructing authority, enlisting local allies, and in democracies maintaining public support for the financial and human costs. And the lens of occupation suggests many of Reconstruction's limitations lay less in betrayals or sharp terms, but in common assumptions, consequences less of intentionality than foolishness or blindness. The framework of occupation, therefore, in some ways threatens the basic narrative of Reconstruction, contemporary narrative of Reconstruction. The monumental disappointments of Reconstruction seem to demand worthy villains in multitude of shapes. But what this obscures are what Lawanda Cox and other people of that generation once called the limits of the possible constraining ideas and structures that need not have anything to do with emancipation itself, but nonetheless influence directly, profoundly, the trajectory of emancipation. In an oblique way, this leads me to the present resistance or discomfort with the framework of occupation because of the implicit comparisons it suggests, not just to post-World War II Germany or Japan, <coughs> but Afghanistan and Iraq. Edward Ayers and Bertram Wyatt Brown have suggestively pointed to the discomforting ways that Iraq and Afghanistan might lead us to ask new questions about what a successful reconstruction might have required, what a real cost accounting might look like. This is painful for scholars because of a basic moral distinction. Most of us, like me, are skeptical of Iraq but supportive of American reconstruction. And placing the two together forces an uneasy moral positioning. But this discomfort, I increasingly believe, is proof of its utility, as it disrupts our sense of our reconstruction, what we need it to do, and lets us see reconstruction on new or, uh, on, new or on its own terms. A basic institutional problem of Reconstruction has either eluded or slip, eluded attention or slipped under the radar, not because it was too well hidden, but because it was too obvious, referred to but not, always in, but not always calculated into the analysis, which was a catastrophic lack of manpower that hindered the reformulation of reliable authority and bodily safety essential to a civil society. Why exactly was Peter Price's federal government so powerless? What does the North's lack of control tell us about how legitimacy and authority were constructed in the 19th century and about the ways that they might have been, we might think of them as built from the ground up, and as Laura Edwards has suggested, and people in their peace? Answering these questions may in turn help historians place reconstruction within work on the 19th century state that has developed all kinds of new analysis but has largely and puzzlingly bypassed or, or reconstruction. Virtually all participants in the South agreed immediately that the South experienced a temporary, sporadically effective occupation after the Confederacy surrendered. As the old states, as one Richmond man wrote in May 1865, stand in the light of a conquered province and has no rights. During the liminal summer of 1865, ex-Confederates continued to describe their experiences in occupation, although their terms changed as troops withdrew from physical to psychological. It's easy to dismiss these common examples as examples of another common phenomenon, which is ex-Confederate hysteria. But many Northerners, in fact, championed their roles as occupiers in that same liminal summer. George Carruthers, who had resigned from the Freedmen Bureau, wrote after his return to his unit in Alexandria that the necessity of a standing army in the southern states is a fact so obvious to every military man who is in circumstances which enable him to judge it that it needs no arguments. From Louisiana, Bureau Clerk Joseph Sumner urged his brother, the future famous philosopher William Graham Sumner, to keep the military here till the crack of doom, if necessary. Scholars have nevertheless, at times, been reluctant to call Reconstruction an occupation because of presumptions about common American nationality, because so many leading figures spoke of the endurance of the states. Building upon the Lincoln administration's insistence that the Confederacy was an internal rebellion, not a war between nations, Chief Justice Salmon Chase argued publicly during this period that secession could not destroy but only disorganize states. But even for President Johnson and Chase, this constitutional claim did not foreclose the idea of a temporary occupation. Occupation in some sort, in fact, had become inevitable once the Lincoln administration dissolved Virginia's Confederate legislature and Johnson overruled Sherman's offer of continuity of local government to surrendering Confederates, 
creating a governance gaps that Chase said could only be filled by indispensable military supervision. Viewed in this light, the differences on the lens of occupation between administration and congressional radicals over state survival seem less consequential. While some argued for systematic re-territorialization, most radicals used state suicide theory to support a policy that in those terms and at those moments was not dramatically unlike the Johnson Party policy. Where they differed from the administration was timing, authority, and eventually black suffrage. Even sharp critics of the insidious doctrine of state survival, like Edward McPherson, argued that the Lincoln and Johnson administrations had essentially acted on the idea of state suicide, but just was afraid to say so aloud. And the key argument then became about not whether there would be an occupation, but who would control it, Congress or White House. And even if it were held in the, in the White House, presidential war powers could endure long after surrender, even under uh, the idea of, uh, of state survival. As Richard Henry Dana argued famously that victors may hold enemies in the grasp of war until it has secured whatever it has a right to require. So if there was, in fact, a broad consensus for some type of occupation, why was it so weak? Historians have struggled to answer this question because both Dunning School and revisionist historians tied occupation to efficacy and to intentionality. The lack of occupation, the lack of analytic space for failed occupations created confusions when scholars analyzed the tools of occupation, the military, the Freedmen's Bureau. But with the new emphasis upon capacity, not intentionality, we can see a reconstruction dismantled not by people who opposed occupation, but by people who didn't understand what it would require. A consensual, uncontroversial plan for massive demobilization took hold over the winter of 1864 to 65, and the Navy had eliminated half its squadrons even before Lee's surrender. After Johnston's surrender, the Army disappeared in Herman Melville's phrase as naturally as northern lights into the morn. By August of 1865, 640,000 of the Union's one million soldiers had been discharged. By November, 800,000. By October 1866, there were only 18,000 left in the South. What drove demobilization was not an effort to sabotage Reconstruction, but the common sense of the moment. Financial fears, inability to understand the depth of Southern reaction, and finally confusion over the relationship between democracy and stability. But this common sense was so widespread that even champions of occupation unthinkingly cheered on demobilization. Joseph Sumner, the Freedmen's Bureau clerk in Louisiana, who wanted the occupation maintained till the crack of doom, at the same time celebrated the disappearance of the very army to a shadow of its former proportions as it melted back into the many busy walks of life. Union soldiers, even radical ones, contributed to the naturalization of demobilization by lobbying fiercely for their mustering out. And as early as December 1865, when General Banks entered Congress in a special election, veterans entered Congress and pressed for those pleas on the floors of Congress. At the same time, anxieties about deficits and war fatigue created a seemingly nonpartisan momentum for financial retrenchment. To fund a million-man army, as is well known, in the two-front war, the Union budget grew from $63 million in 1860 to $1.3 billion in 1865, and the cost had largely been covered by $2.4 billion in interest-bearing bonds. In the winter of 1864, the Secretary of the Treasury warned the Union might have to give up the fight or default if the debt reached $3 billion. Lincoln's hands-on management of cutbacks, saving the War Department a million dollars a day, associated him strongly with the idea of retrenchment, a word frequently invoked in his eulogies. And although political economy scholars presume retrenchment reflected a conscious desire to undermine Reconstruction, this conflation of results and intentions is weaker than it appears. Even radicals, even the most radical of radicals, celebrated their joint commitments to retrenchment and Reconstruction, not yet aware of the contradictions. Also important and underappreciated is the role of simple confusion. While Southern historians have reasons to worry that Elliot West's recent invocation of a greater reconstruction might diminish the centrality of the story of emancipation to the era, the concept does help us remember that American thoughts turned in many directions at war's end, to the West, to Mexico, to monarchical Europe, to the debt, to reincorporating veterans. Radicals and no small number of moderates wanted to occupy and reconstruct the South. They just didn't think they would need manpower to do it. Like many occupiers, they vastly overestimated local people's obedience to laws they didn't consider legitimate. Radicals and many moderates relied upon a misunderstanding of the meaning of politics, a belief that democracy itself created stability, solving the problem of the South by enfranchising freed people. A cashier wrote, we have either got to have a large standing army to protect the Negroes, or we must give them the ballot so they can protect themselves. And the last, to my mind, is in every way the best end result. When Northern politics created a vacuum of effective authority, ex-Confederates asserted themselves tentatively, then ferociously over the nearly stateless Southern society. 
While Southern response resembles the common <clears throat> tactical positioning of displaced elites during occupation, most dis uh, during occupations, not driven by racial pathologies. Many ex-Confederates noted by May and June that it will be to the Yankees' interest to treat us leniently and kindly. General Sherman has disbanded his army and is sending them home. Against this dissolution, the North relied upon tiny isolated garrisons and the Freedmen's Bureau to create order. But manpower posed major problems. Across the former Confederate states, the Bureau never was able to maintain more than 900 agents at any one time to cover 3.5 million ex-slaves. Agents despaired of protecting the freed people outside of the narrow circumference of their power. Scholars have for good reason long made much of Congress's return in December 1865, its growing radicalization over the spring of 1866, and its actions after the midterm of November 1866. This was a sweeping transformation as a quiescent reconstruction policy suddenly grew teeth, but it did not grow troop counts. By autumn 1866, there were fewer 18 than 18,000 soldiers in the South. How could this be? To answer this question, one puzzled onlooker, carpetbagger and novelist Albion Tourget, interrogated a North that would not perform the duty laid upon it as conqueror, that would order bricks but not provide straw for their making. To explain why the North had been so foolish, Tourget blamed not failures but success. The flourishing structures of Northern society kept Northerners from realizing they were, in fact, structures not naturally occurring conditions. They required nurturing. They could not be willed into existence. They had to be constructed. Therefore, in his view, Reconstruction was a story of limitations, but banal ones. The blind arrogance of victory, the inability to imagine the demands of occupation, the unwillingness to pay the price of success. This is not the current story of Reconstruction. The standing narrative of Reconstruction is a alluring one. It's two stories, a reassuring celebration of democracy and a horror story of democracy's betrayal. Satisfying as this story is, I cannot help but wonder if we are nearing the end of its utility, if we have learned what we're capable of learning from it. New lines of analysis, more engaged with the limits of democracy, might perhaps end us wrestling again with the challenge of maintaining public and even scholarly interest in functioning institutions, the gap between support for policies and support for paying for them, and narratives that force us from the reassuring sense that the failure of Reconstruction lies in some external them, and to the dispiriting, terrifying, but useful engagement with the idea that its failure may lie in a more recognizable sense of us. Thank you. Okay. On October 29, 1869, a gang of 65 white men surrounded the Greene County, Georgia home of Abram Colby. Colby had been expelled from the Georgia legislature, but he still insisted on exercising his right to vote and encouraging other black men to do the same, a move that angered the white men. The men broke down the door of Colby's home and dragged him outside where they whipped him. In the chaos, Colby's mother, wife, and daughter tried to intervene on his behalf. According to Colby's testimony before the Joint Select Committee investigating the affairs in the late insurrectionary states, his young daughter begged the white men not to, not to carry him away. One of the men reacted to the little girl's intervention by pointing his gun at her, which finally subdued her. Abram Colby and his family, or Abram Colby survived the assault, but in his opinion, his daughter did not. Though the men did not kill Colby's child outright, he believed the trauma of the raid, seeing him dragged away and having a gun drawn on her, had contributed to her death. The little girl, quote, never got, out of, never got over it, he testified. Colby remarked that his daughter's death within a year of the raid, and probably his inability to protect her, was, quote, the part that grieves me most of all. Testimonies of black Southerners like Abram Colby project flashes of light into the otherwise dark abyss of our understandings of the impact of racial violence on African Americans. Whereas scholars have utilized transcripts of Reconstruction uh, sort of testimonies in the form of bureau records, congressional uh, testimonies, and later ex-slave narratives. They've studied these materials to show the existence of racial violence and black people's resistance to it. I use these texts to advance thinking about African Americans' representations of this violence. Exploring African American victims and witnesses' representations of racial violence reveals the issues that were important to them, such issues as the ways that violence upset gender dynamics, the physical and psychological trauma that victims endured, 
uh, the impact of violence on children, and also issues of displacement. Because many of these people, after they survived a night riding, night, night riding attacks on their families, felt that they could no longer stay where they lived, so they were forced to relocate. One of the issues of critical importance to many testifiers was the impact of night riding on black children. For our purposes, night riding involved groups of organized armed white men who terrorized black people. Night riding was different from regular assaults or even some lynchings in that perpetrators surprised African Americans in their homes during the nighttime hours. The instigating factors that triggered night riding range from simply dominating and punishing specific individuals who resisted a white person's authority to returning ex-Confederate soldiers venting their frustrations out on African Americans or terrorizing black people before, during, or after an election. The coordinated nature of night riding increased the brutality of violence met out to African Americans and the likelihood of death. Night riders often held African Americans hostage in a state of domestic captivity. Domestic captivity generally involved white men attacking black people while they were in or near their homes. Though there weren't always physical barriers blocking African Americans' escape, the threat of deadly violence posed by the men's forced presence in or around black people's homes trapped all family members inside. Indeed, when the white men invaded or surrounded black people's homes or even dragged family members out into their yards, these men became the most powerful figures in the worldview of the black captives. These night riders did not have to use physical violence to control their captives. Oftentimes, the armed white men's mere presence in black people's understanding of the capriciousness of violent whites collectively reduced the victim's sense of autonomy and undermined the psychological resistance of many captives. No member of African American's family was safe from physical or psychological violence during episodes of domestic activity. In the context of resisting reconstruction and reestablishing the antebellum racial hierarchy, targeting black families was not a, ma a matter of happenstance. White men's attacking African American families in their homes was a direct assault on black people's conceptual conceptualization of their freedom. Children experience many of the same horrors of night riding as their parents. As such, the violence black children endured was physical, sexual, verbal, and emotional, and it ranged from mild to life-threatening. White men threatened and attacked children for supposed transgressions they believed they committed. <coughs> Violent whites also exploited black youth for instrumental purposes, attacking or threatening to attack them to extort compliance or submission from the adults in their lives. Children's size, age, and unpredictable behavior in the context of violent attacks made them even more vulnerable to direct violence than adults. They also endured the long-term effects of this violence, being orphaned, separated from their parents or siblings, the significant hardship of family displacement that often followed night riding attacks. And in total, I think that we should study children in the context of racial violence because in doing so, we learned that they were not only caught up in the crossfire of uh, cross-racial conflict between adults, they were also direct victims of this violence. From the testimonies of parents like Abram Colby, we can see that children seem to uh, encounter some of the most life-threatening danger during night riding attacks on black families. The very nature of night riding increased the likelihood that black children would be present during episodes of racial violence and thereby bear witness to attacks on their parents or be physically or psychologically harmed themselves. Night riders often communicated a willingness to maim or kill everyone, and they exercised complete control over their hostages and demanded compliance with every request. Night riding and domestic captivity presented black families with the paradoxes of life, and, uh, life versus personal dignity. Husbands and wives wanted to defend each other, and parents certainly wanted to defend their children. However, most people understood that any action they took could have a significant impact on everyone in the home. Indeed, the presence of women and children in homes prompted black men who were often the primary targets of night riding violence to stand down and de-escalate the situation rather than physically resisting their attackers. The cases of Reuben Sheets and Martin Anthony can illustrate the choices black parents face. Reuben Sheets of Walton County, Georgia testified before Congress that he wanted to defend his family but he was quote, scared nearly about to death 
that the men would shoot him, but he also had to consider the fact that, quote, his wife and children got scared. Similarly, Martin Anthony explained that he did not defend himself and his family because, quote, my wife was not at home and there was nobody there but me and my daughter. Anthony's 14-year-old daughter ran under the bed as the men came in. The men didn't touch her because she stayed under the bed. Instead, Anthony's daughter watched as the men beat him and carried him from his home. Anthony testified that he did not resist because, quote, I was afraid that they would shoot me and probably harm his daughter if she cried out or tried to intervene on his behalf. Most testimonies indicate that African-American parents were immobilized during attacks. In 1868, Floridian Doc Roundtree and his wife and 10 children were in their home when a gang of five to 10 men invaded it. The men flung Ch Roundtree's children out into the yard. They whipped Roundtree, his wife, and three of his daughters and one of his, uh, three of his sons, excuse me, and one of his daughters. Roundtree was so injured that he could not intervene to protect his wife and children from being attacked. George and Samson Reed had to watch while Knight Riders pistol whipped his 16-year-old son, Andy. As we saw with Abram Colby's description of his daughter hiding under the bed, black youth were probably just as terrified as their parents were. However, they probably lacked the full mental capacity to understand what was going on. For example, they could probably not process their parents' failure to take action to protect them from harm or gauge the behavior of the white men in their homes. Infant and children often cry during night riding attacks, which intensify the situation by eliciting action from their parents to calm them, which probably further antagonize the night riders. Moreover, terror found black children asserting their own agency and taking such action as intervening when their parents were under attack. This included begging Knight Riders to spare their parents, as Abram Colby's daughter did. This is probably why Colby's daughter raised a larger protest, even after, even after the men insisted that, the, uh, that everyone in the family stop crying and stop trying to intervene. Children's unpredictability and their panic responses increased the likelihood that they would become direct victims of physical violence. For example, when Knight Riders invaded the home of Henry Reed in 1869, his 15-year-old son panicked and jumped out the window, which prompted one of the white men to shoot at the boy. Henry and his wife, in the context of the raid, thought that their child was dead. It was only after Henry followed his son out of the window that he learned that the boy was alive, but it suffered uh, a wound from the bullet that grazed his ear. In addition to the physical attacks that children witnessed and endured, there is also the matter of the aftermath of violence. Testifiers' accounts underscore the point that violence extended well beyond the physical attack, the rape, or even the night riding episode. Children had to deal with their own physical injuries as well as those for their parents and grandparents. What is more, night riding violence increased the likelihood that children lost their parents or siblings to death or became separated from them. They also suffered from being displaced their parents' loss of their homes or their incomes as they recovered from injuries or relocated. All of these consequences of violence likely created devastating uncertainty among children and youth. With many parents suffering from their own physical and psychological injuries, children were likely left to make sense of what happened on their own. As the testimonies of Samuel Garrison and Scipio Eager reveal, children who lost parents during or because of night riding had to deal with the emotional upheaval as well as being separated from their families. In 1868, night riders um, raided the home of Leanna and Jerry Garrison. They killed Jerry and they injured Samuel, the couple's son who was visiting at the time. Understanding that their traumatized mother was in little position to take care of her youngest children, Samuel and his brother separated their younger siblings and took them to their respective homes in Georgia and Mississippi. Scipio Eager had to leave when Georgia white supremacists returned to his home accompanied by dogs after they whipped him and killed his brother. The brother's children remained with their elderly parents who were in no physical or financial position to take care of them in the absence of their sons. Scipio worried, quote, there was nobody to look after them but me, for my brother is dead and I had to go away to save my life. 
Though we do not know for sure what happened to these and other children who experienced night riding violence, many adult victims of violence testified that they experienced displacement as a result of enduring violence, which opens a small window onto what happened to children after attacks. African Americans were displaced by Reconstruction violence when night riders destroyed their homes or ordered people to leave or be killed. Families also left because they simply did not feel safe remaining. In all, many traumatized families relocated simply to avoid further violence. And so what happens is that children join the troops of displaced families and as such, they endure the consequences of having their lives uprooted. Though displaced people survived attacks, finding safety and security was a completely different story for many of them. Indeed, displacement extended the chaos and uncertainty of violent attacks because adults had to recover from physical wounds, they had to relocate, they had to establish housing and new accommodations, find new jobs and get new sources of credit. Families, and so part of what happens is that what we see is that the, the sort of trauma is extended well beyond the physical attack. In all, while providing incredible insight into the violence, into the violence endured, so this evidence, while, while providing incredible insight into the violence endured, is frustrating in that it cannot answer as many questions as arise. Nonetheless, my preliminary investigations suggest several conclusions. First, we can confirm the presence of children in the context of our attacks that are often understood for much of the existing literature on this violence as being directed at adults. Children not only witness the violent attacks on their parents, they also experience physical violence, as well as the sort of social and economic effects of violence. Second, we can learn how the presence of children shape the action or inaction of adults in the context of attacks. Third, we can see the extent to which they and their family suffered from enduring this violence. Understanding that children endured and bore witness to racial violence is not simply about checking off another box in the category of victims of Reconstruction era violence. On the contrary, it illuminates the ways that racial violence not only traumatized victims and witnesses, but also contributed to the social disorganization of African American families. This is especially important when we consider just how, families, just how fragile these families were. Indeed, many of these families had only been recently reconstituted after the Civil War and slavery's end. Even if we do not have primary evidence of the causal link between racial violence and the social disorganization of black families after slavery, the research findings of anthropologists and psychologists who study families in the context of conflict and violence in other parts of the world offer insight that suggests that the terror, the terror of violence directed at African American children became another method of social control and the reorganization of black people's lives in the post-emancipation South. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks again to everyone who's here and thank you for those three really terrific papers and of course as the chair I also have to thank you for so considerately staying on, on time so um, there's going to be, we're going to be just fine with the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there, I, I'm going to give. I'm going to point out a couple of points in my comments that might be a little sort of uh, disconnected with the papers that were actually given because um, the three papers I got were a bit longer to varying degrees than the papers that were delivered here. So I'll try to kind of highlight that so you all aren't too confused. Um, so the title of this panel advertises new directions, and <clears throat> that is indeed what we have here. All three papers represent fresh, unpublished, original research that um, all, in various ways, engage with central problems, both to the period of Reconstruction and to American history writ large. Kadada Williams focuses on the presence of children in scenes of horrible violence during Reconstruction, particularly those that occurred in people's homes. In night riding incidents, groups of whites visited black people's homes and used physical violence, as well as emotional terror, to intimidate and injure free people. Now, it may not be totally clear from the paper that Kadada just delivered orally because some of this plays out in the footnotes, but the most noteworthy aspect of, uh, to me of this paper was um, the sensitive use of theoretical insights drawn from the interdisciplinary field of trauma theory, 
and the use of empirical data from wholly different places and times, for example, 20th century Argentina and the Dirty War. Precise historical contexts surely vary, but I think it's reasonable to believe that there are patterns or consistencies in the effects of unpredictable terrorist violence that are inflicted on entire families. And so it makes a lot of sense to use other uh, comparative examples, uh, particularly in a situation where the primary sources are relatively un kind of giving, like there's a, there's a sort of a dearth of primary sources, although not only because of that. I was particularly interested in a quotation that's in the paper, but that uh, Kadada didn't read here, from Jacobo Timmerman's observation that violence was corrosive within families. He wrote, quote, suddenly an entire culture based on familial love, devotion, the capacity for mutual sacrifice collapses when this kind of inf violence is inflicted. So that the, the proposition is attacks on families help torturers meet their immediate goals, but they also inflict long-lasting damage that can manifest itself in the future in a variety of different ways. From the perspective of African American history and a sort of received wisdom about how oppression works, I think in US history more generally, this proposition is somewhat counterintuitive. Many historians have emphasized or even assumed that white oppression, even of the most virulent, violent kind, pushed African Americans together, forced them to develop a shared group identity that transcended differences and helped them survive the depths of oppression and ultimately to mobilize against it. By contrast, Kadada makes us think about how terrorist violence inflicted on family groups that often included children, quote, contributed to the social disorganization of African American families. Now, the paper doesn't define what uh, she means by social disorganization, but the term really caught my attention because it suggested that Kadada was engaging sociological literature on African American family structures and inequality. In the, in the mid 20th century, the, the so called social organization of black families appeared different from white families to social scientists. Um, recently, more recently, uh, social scientists, sociologists have rejected the once popular concepts of a static or dysfunctional culture of poverty. Um, and to argued that African Americans' lack of access to decent jobs had, and this again is drawing on the sort of a mid 20th century and later literature, lack of access to decent jobs had ripple effects, creating not just poverty, but also less incentive to marry and stay married to the same person. So in other words, I'm talking about ways that people have tried to account for what they understand to be differences in black and white family structures since the mid 20th century. Perhaps Kadada here is suggesting that another defining feature of life, at least for some black families, were the legacies of domestic terrorism, experiences with violence that frayed family ties and left people displaced, perhaps less trusting and less resilient. And I wonder and if that's the direction that you might be heading with that research and be curious to hear more about what you, what you have to say about that. Besides looking forward in time, this paper also prompts us to look backward um, slavery itself required a kind of domestic captivity. Many freed families were likely already familiar with white people's lack of regard for black family relationships, parental authority, and children's innocence. So in other words, I would also be curious to think backward in time to the ways in which the night riding incidents that Kadada is talking about actually kind of replicated or in some ways were a new version of older power relationships and violence that was characteristic of slavery itself. Jim Downs also asked us to think about a topic for which there's frustratingly little documentation. Smallpox coursed through the South during and after the Civil War, preying particularly on freed people who, especially in cities and in so-called contraband camps, lived in overcrowded conditions that were conducive to the spread of disease. Never officially denominated an epidemic, smallpox of this era was nonetheless responsible for thousands of deaths among the newly freed. And if we think about smallpox in conjunction with other diseases, particularly cholera and yellow fever, as well as the impoverishment of the South as a whole, the disastrous crop cycles of 1866 and 1867, and the displacement wrought by the war itself, and also the kind of violence that Kadada is talking about, we have an overall picture of people struggling just to stay alive, faced with physical debility and cataclysmic emotional loss. Jim wants us to reimagine the end of slavery as, quote, a history of freedom born out of disease, destitu destitution, and death. There's evidence of the spread of smallpox in reports of Freedmen's Bureau agents, whose uh, reports chart cases and make recommendations. 
And yet there seems to be pre precious few detailed testimonials, and that is particularly first-hand accounts by free people themselves. Now, the lack of documentation about the smallpox outbreak, Jim argues, is no coincidence. Free people, he speculated, tried to hide their affliction with the disease, afraid of the judgment it would bring upon them. Northerners writing about the South also concealed it, Greg argues, because, quote, only signs of progress or of hope could be displayed to the rest of the country in order for them to agree to economically invest in the South. Yet, um, this particular explanation seems to me a bit inadequate. Negative representations of the South, in fact, appeared constantly in the Northern press and in Congress. Um, just to give an example, Eric Foner begins chapter four of Reconstruction with the line, Northern journalists, quote, telegraphed back reports of a devastated society and follows with a litany of examples of that. So I would like to press you a little bit to think about other reasons why the smallpox epidemic in particular might not have been represented because there wasn't really a prohibition on negative representations of the South by, by Northern journalists. Uh, the question remains why the government didn't do more to stem the outbreak, particularly when they knew things that they could do uh, to, to try to deal with it. Jim argues that medical and governmental officials believed African Americans, like Native Americans, were a race destined to be subjugated to whites and would likely die out in conditions of freedom. But I'm not sure that Samuel Cox, a Democratic representative from Ohio, is an apt representative of the folks who ran the Freedmen's Bureau and the federal government. Uh, there can be no doubt that the federal effort to stem disease and provide health care for African Americans uh, after the war was inadequate. But was it because its directors and sponsors believed African Americans were destined to die out? Or was it because of a larger failure by the government to pass measures required to place the post-war South on a solid footing? A failure that was surely inseparable from the fact that those in the greatest need were Afri people of African descent, but that had many other causes as well. And these actually are questions that Greg Downs' paper takes up. Um, I admire this paper's breadth and ambition, and I think it's great that Greg is looking for new purchase on a question that's been at the heart of Reconstruction history for a long time. Greg proposes that we think about the realities of the federal presence in the South, essentially the Freedmen's Bureau and the Army, in terms of efficacy. And that he brings out that paper, that term, a lot more in the, in the written paper uh, than necessarily in the talk today. But this approach, he argues, uh, stands in contrast to previous historians who have focused on either racism, I think is, or on labor. So he sort of sets up two frameworks, a framework that look, looks at these issues through the prism of race, racism, and one through labor. The question is, that Greg is interested in is what is the institutional capacity of these federal agencies? What could they actually accomplish with what they had? Repeatedly, he returns to the problem of manpower. There just were not enough federal agents on the ground, particularly soldiers, to do what Greg claims the U.S. government wanted to do, which was occupy the South. Perhaps the heart of the paper are quotations from Freedmen's Bureau agents George Carruthers and Joseph Sumner, both of whom simultaneously believed more troops were required to reinforce the Union victory and secure basic rights for free people, and that a rapid de military demobilization was required. Why didn't they understand that these two things were in conflict? How was it possible that people like Carruthers and Sumner could not understand that the two goals were incompatible, that one couldn't have both an effective occupation of the South and a rapid discharge of soldiers and officers to their families and homes? The answer, Greg suggests, again, more strongly in the written paper than in today's delivery, is that they were fools. <laughs> Reconstruction's limitations, he says, lie in, quote, widespread unconscious, although I think he changed that word to common in this paper, but I'll, I'll go with what I had. Widespread unconscious assumptions, the consequence less of intentionality than foolishness, mistakes not of ideology but of understandings about the nature of stability. Northerners wanted to occupy and remake the South, Greg argues. They just didn't know how. Now, I frankly find it a little bit difficult to imagine that a cadre of political and economic leaders who had just managed to transform the United States economy in service of war, build a vast army and a navy, win a war against a formidable foe, and pass enormous amounts of innovative legislation were quite so hamstrung by foolishness or unconscious desires. These were pretty competent people. It seems to me that, um, in fact, there was not a consensus in favor of a serious occupation, that what the victorious Union lacked was the will to occupy, not necessarily the capacity. Now, I'm not exactly sure whether I'm disagreeing with you or not here, <laughs> but Greg himself catalogs a number of reasons, conscious reasons, that were debated in public, uh, rational reasons, why the push for military demobilization won out over any impulse for a long and meaningful occupation of the defeated South. For example, soldiers' desire to go home, 
policymakers concerned with government debt and the desire to rein in spending and competing military needs, not to mention, in other words, on the border and the plains, not to mention general uh, resistance to standing armies in peacetime and an unfortunately naive faith that voting rights for African Americans would sufficiently protect them. Two factors that Greg doesn't mention but have also been noted in the literature are commitment to the Federalist order established in the Constitution and a lack of commitment to the well-being of African Americans in the South. So it's not clear to me why, with all these very well-documented reasons that de demobilization won out over a more robust occupation, why do we still need more explanation? Why do we have to characterize them as fools? So I'd like to hear more about what, how you think the concept of efficacy can open up the study of Reconstruction. I'm just not quite sure where, where that kind of gets us. Now I just want to turn to uh, kind of what can, what are these three papers, which are obviously very different, um, if anything, what can they tell us about new directions in the study of Reconstruction? Um, first, these papers all share an emphasis on constraints over agency. Historians of slavery have lately been uh, having a conversation about power, resistance, and agency. In an important contribution to that conversation, Walter Johnson critiqued a generation of scholarship that he believed emphasized slaves' agency at the expense of exploring structures of oppression, understood survival itself as resistance, and that was a problem, and in the process reflexively imposed on the enslaved ideals of liberal individualism. Although these papers don't engage with that debate directly, they reveal a similar zeitgeist, emphasizing the multi-generational impact of racist violence, experiences of suffering, shame, and death, and in Greg's case, political constraint rather than possibility. So this is all quite a change from the tenor of the field 20 or even 10 years ago when everyone was talking about everyday forms of resistance. I mean, just to kind of say it in a shorthand way. So this is, this is a very different set of papers, I think, than you would have had uh, a decade ago or so. So number two, to varying degrees, all three papers reflect a current focus on the role of violence in Reconstruction and a critique of liberal assumptions about American politics. The work of Stephen Hahn is crucial here. Foner, Eric Foner's Reconstruction seemed to imply that universal manhood suffrage would have reformed the South if only violence had not interfered. By contrast, Hahn's view in A Nation Under Our Feet is that this, in the South, violence and politics were so thoroughly implicated as to be inseparable. Many of Hahn's students and others, not only Hahn's students, but others influenced by his work, are following similar lines of inquiry. And I think this new work has certain trademarks. Emphasis on the illiberalism of Southern institutions, the argument that liberal solutions didn't stand a chance against organized violence, the emphasis on struggles over power in public, and the implication that the only real hope for reconstruction would have been the um, use of military force by the US government on a scale that was basically unthinkable. So finally, um, I'd like to broach something that I'm going to call the DRPR narrative, the Dunning Revisionist Post-Revisionist Narrative, <laughs> DRPR. Um, which so often continues to frame new work on Reconstruction. Now again, um, these, this kind of framing was more obvious in the written papers um, of Greg and Jim than in the oral delivery. But I still think it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, Eric Foner clearly spelled out this framework in a 1982 Reviews in American History article and then in the Introduction to Reconstruction. I won't recapitulate the details here. I think you all are probably familiar with it. The DRPR narrative plays a prominent role in Jim and Greg's papers. Both authors represent themselves as correcting an overcorrection by the revisionists. So Dunning School, revisionists, pendulum, go back to like correcting an overcorrection. Um, I had my own experience with the kind of dominance, the unyielding dominance of this narrative when I uh, was writing a historiographic essay, um, possibly in this kind of purely bloody-minded spirit, I proposed that my essay would begin with the Foner era and not recapitulate the DRPR narrative. But the editor of the volume I was working with um, insisted that I use the familiar framework, returning to Dunning and explaining how the revisionists came next and then the post-revisionists. Now, I want to quickly give four reasons why I think we should think twice before continuing to frame our work this way. And I know this is a little bit heretical. <laughs> First, the DRPR narrative just seems stale to me. Surely we can do better than continuing to add adjectives to the word revisionist. I couldn't tell, um, in, in Greg's paper, he, he offers the term emancipated post-revisionist um, for scholars who kind of draw on the post-revisionist but emphasize free people's agency more than the post-revisionist. So I couldn't tell if that term emancipated post-revisionist was, was proposed seriously or with tongue-in-cheek. 
Whatever the case, Eric Foner's reconstruction, now almost a quarter century old, was widely considered a culmination of the revisionist and po post-revisionist cycle. Why didn't Foner's book create conditions in which we could finally lay Dunning to rest? How about beginning to create new categories within a broader rubric that we could call post-Foner scholarship? Actually, I don't really care what um, the next phase of re Reconstruction scholarship is called. I just want it to be really good. <clears throat> Second, <clears throat> the DRPR narrative curiously grants to an early 20th century racist we all profess to disavow enormous power to define the field. Every time we condemn the Dunningites, we're also drawing attention to them. I don't think other subfields of American history as ritualistically invoke their early 20th century forebearers, people like John Commons for labor history or Charles and Mary Beard for economic history. Why do we honor Dunning this way? Why should we continue to? Third, being hooked on the DRPR narrative, and this gets to sort of more of the content of how we actually define the problems that we study, uh, this probably makes us worse readers of other people's writing. Granted, historians' work depends on, uh, in part on finding patterns and therefore omissions or gaps in the literature, but the DRPR narrative may also encourage us to read in ways that uh, reduce excellent older scholarship to one-dimensional caricature and prevent us from appreciating its actual and potential contributions. Um, just for example, in the paper, Greg characterizes three decades' worth of scholarship on the Freedmen's Bureau as contributions to the history of ideology, in other words, newer Freedmen's Bureau scholarship that uh, decided that the Freedmen's Bureau was good in contrast to the older Freedmen's Bureau scholarship that said it was bad. Um, but he neglects the, much of the substance of that work, which has actually examined precisely the questions about efficacy that he's asking. So we should absolutely read older work on Reconstruction, but we should avoid reading it through the oversimplifying lens of the DRPR narrative. And last, I think the DRPR narrative inhibits our creativity. It directs us toward a set of questions and kinds of arguments that perhaps we just don't need to be making anymore. So I want to argue for putting the narrative aside when developing research projects. How do we do that? We might discover and mind understudied concepts or phenomena that bubble up from the sources themselves, such as visions of a personal relationship to power, as Greg Downs' book, recent book does. Ideas about equality, which I tried to handle in, uh, in my recent book sexual violence, which Hannah Rosen's book takes up, and citizenship, which Michael Vorenberg is working on. Probably more, even more reliably than that, we can look to other places and times, as both Kidata and Greg's papers suggest, not just for comparative cases, in Kidata's case, domestic terrorism, in Greg's, the kind of comparative history of military occupations, but also to learn how scholars in other fields ask questions and understand categories. So this is what uh, my colleague Dylan Penningroth did so effectively by drawing on Africanists' approaches to slavery, kinship, and property in his work on the 19th century U.S. South. So the period at issue features some of the most profound dilemmas and remarkable transfer transformations in, of United States history. Fortunately, it continues to draw the attention of historians who, at least speaking for myself, are riveted by its astounding drama and its continuing relevance. We should have plenty to discuss. Thank you. Um, so, should I just, uh, well, do you guys want to respond? Quickly. Okay. I, I want to leave time for questions. I would say two things. First of all, I think the uh, foolishness question is an interesting one, and I think it probably reflects a view of human nature um, rather than a uh, specific interpretive difference. In other words, Kate used the efficacy of the Republicans as proof that they couldn't be fools. My view is of human nature is that, you know, efficaciousness and foolishness exist side by side. Um, and in some ways, I think that the displacement of, uh, you know, that in, in a sense of narrowing of human capacity um, in that way is part of what has allowed us to write a reconstruction historiography um, that, that ends up prizing intentionality and presuming that people got what they wanted. Um, so I guess I start with the baseline, starting from your baseline, that people who are competent can't be fools, that it doesn't make sense. Starting from a baseline, obviously here I'm writing and thinking about, you know, Tourget, both in the interpretation of Reconstruction and in the interpretation that he's trying to work through of human nature, that when you think what I think is a more interesting and complicated and realistic, though painful way, um, that competencies and blind spots are inherent in me, in you, you know, in all humility, in all of us, that I think it opens up more of uh, subtle and nuanced ways of thinking about how these things can coexist in similar people and therefore not making the presumption of saying we've got this outcome, let's assume that somebody wanted that outcome. Uh, and that, I think, is the tie that has, uh, has limited, uh, one of the ties that has limited reconstruction historiography.
The other thing in terms of the DRPR thing, I think is very interesting, but I think Kate is isolated in effect, not a cause. I think why do we talk so much? I mean, I think reading old historiography is good, all of that, but I think why is it that we have to introduce everything with this DRPR narrative is because we're not introducing things in relationship to each other. And so that if we had a field in which um, I think Kate sees this as causing this inability of us to argue, I would suggest the opposite. The fact that we're not arguing with each other means that we have to keep reaching back to place ourselves. If instead we could really operate, really operating in a postponer moment would not be to sort of not talk about the older scholarship, but would be to talk about each other more critically. Respectfully, interestingly, with engagement, but also critically about, you know, that's a sort of smart, you know, partly persuasive, you know, idea that I can, you know, respect its intelligence, sincerity, hard work, but in my proportion of values, you know, this is going to come out a little higher. If we do that, it's not that we won't talk about the DRPR narrative, it's that it'll take a different place in our work. So I do think she's isolated an irritating aspect of what we do, but I do think it's not a cause. I don't think that's what's keeping us from doing it. We're keeping us from doing it, right? <laughs> and I think if we can do it, then that'll sort of naturally be submerged. I, think, yeah. I, I never respond um, to comments publicly, but I felt like I would just do it before I tweet it. Um, <laughs> I just want to just take one piece of this. One, I'm happy to, let's say, let's put a moratorium on phoner just for certain questions, certain issues, and particularly Foner does an excellent job of charting political mobilization, building on someone who's not been mentioned, it's just a voice in the black historiographical tradition. But to argue that there was no prohibition on negative views of the South is to sort of take a piece of him and sort of undermine what's actually happening. I want to make a distinction between the difference between talking about broken bridges and crop cycles and the fact that people were dying out, and that people were dying. And that what happens is Kate asked me to sort of raise the question of, you know, give, provide another explanation to why smallpox hasn't been talked about. That's the problem. The problem is that since the 19th century, people will keep on trying to explain why smallpox is breaking out without recognizing the corporal reality that people were dying at the moment of freedom. So the fact is, this notion of there's no prohibition of negative images, there's a difference between a broken bridge and an entire population of people who everyone, from the New York Times to the Alabama Independent to just some crazy, albeit <laughs> a congressman from the from Illinois thought that this notion of extinction was happening. And here's the problem with extinction. Extinction turns a biological crisis into a discourse. So that, again, we shift our attention to explaining what happens, instead of to the corporal reality that the moment of freedom, so many people are dying. And that Foner's attention is to get us to focus on the ballot box, to focus on, to focus on political mobilization. You're not supposed to see people dying, and there's a reason for that. And everyone was invested in this. Even 20th century historians inspired by the civil rights movement who thought they were doing a good job don't want you to see people dying for the political implications of what that means. And if we continue to sort of do this thing of responding to why it's there, we miss the actual real reality of the fact that the emancipation period produced enormous amounts of sickness and disease and mortality, and that didn't result because of what Dunning said. And that's why we have to keep on raising him, you know, sort of engaging him, because there is still, in our contemporary moment, a notion of black, about black degeneracy and immortality. And mortality. I'm not going to focus on the DRPR narrative, um, but I will sort of like point to, um, go back to several points that Kate raised about uh, my paper and this new project that I'm trying to work on. One, in terms of um, the literature, in terms of the sort of social disorganization of the family, I think the literature coming out of sociology and the literature that some historians rely on uh, and even write about, there's the sort of bookend, slavery and racial discrimination in the context of freedom. And in between that is these families during Reconstruction who suffered significant violence and had to start over from scratch. And there's the reality that in terms of, I think one of the, probably one of the best things I found in looking at the literature uh, written outside of the United States, which was uh, suggested by a senior scholar, who basically said don't read the historians of violence in the United States. Read what psychologists and historians and psychologists are doing in other places of the world. And one of the things that the literature does is it really forces you, uh, that literature coming from sociology and anthropology, it really forces you to focus on the victims and how they make sense of what happened to them. 
and like gives you the tools to really sort of ask the right questions in terms of, or to ask the right questions, or to see what people are talking about when they relive when they relive accounts of violence. <coughs> Having so sort of going in going into the uh, sources from the perspective of trauma, what you see is that most people they talk about ways that their lives are not the same, and there's the issue of how do you live with yourself and with each other. <coughs> after having survived one of these night riding attacks. How do husbands and wives look at each other, again, in the same way? The reality is that they don't. And the challenge in terms of the sources is that they don't point, they don't sort of, they don't point that out. They don't say, we could never look at each other again. But there are threads in terms of how they talk about their lives before and after violence that I think it's important to sort of explore because it shows you how they're never the same and they know that they're not the same again. Uh, the other thing in terms of um, the sort of looking backward in terms of the literature of slavery, I think one of the big differences is freedom. You know, in the context of slavery, enslaved people understood that their masters or people from the slaveholding class that they could come into their homes and they could do X, Y, and Z. In the context of freedom, many of these people, they don't believe that's a, that that's an issue that they're going to have to deal with. And when they talk about the sort of... Um, when they testify about the verbal exchange and they say, I had to do that then, but I don't have to do that now. So there's a sort of sense and understanding that um, free people's homes are a protected space. It's a new space. And it's a new space that should be free of the sort of um, things that they had to endure in the context of slavery. You know, and what we see them doing in these homes is they're formalizing unions, they're bringing their families together, they're establishing new gender roles and conventions in the context of freedom. So there are all of these things taking place, and what we see in the testimonies is the fact that violence becomes a temporal marker. What we see in the literature, or excuse me, in the sources, is they describe their lives before violence, during violence, and after violence. And you can see how big of a difference there is uh, in looking at the literature. Um, and so I think I'll leave it to that and open it to okay, questions. OK, thanks. I'm going to stand up just so I can see everyone. Michael. For Professor Downs, in the interest of... Which one? Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to jump, but we're both Downs. I'm oh, oh, sorry. Okay. You. Yeah. In the interest of collegiality and you know, civil discourse and everything, I was going to ask, as a, one of the objective constraints that you're dealing with, have you given any thought to how effective the Union troops would have been in the summer of 1865 at repressing anything? Because what I found from, from my studies of Alabama, is that they're on the point of mutiny in terms of wanting to go home so desperately. And it's coloring their attitude towards the freedmen, because the freedmen are coming into the army camps. And you get this rather severe impatience with their presence among these soldiers. So one of the constraints is that this army couldn't, it's going to be tough to enforce much of anything of two months after. But I think that's a great question. Um, and Did, I thought about wait, I, I, Hold on one second. Did everyone hear it in the back? Yeah, OK, all right, sorry. I think that's a great question. And I, I touched on uh, a little bit um, in this how powerful um, the force of, and especially how sort of permeable in a democracy the force of this, this urge to go home is. Um, and I think that there are, you know, I think it's a complicated question. One of the things that I'm looking to do in this project is really to try and map out place by place, um, you know, month by month, um, how, what, what happens if we put what we're able to, which is going to be an imperfect record, a sense of, of, of violence, sort of what types of violence, what numbers of violence, alongside these military numbers. Um, and that's a big project, and I'm nowhere near, you know, uh, nowhere near the end of it. So, you know, I would, you know, uh, but I think that the, you're right, that that's a huge, huge question and a hugely open question. Um, anecdotally, there's all kinds of stuff that's exactly what you say, uh, you know, sort of, uh, of, of, uh, of soldiers who are unwilling to, uh, willing to take, unwilling to take action. There's also anecdotally a lot of evidence of the other, of places where soldiers in the summer and even in places where they stay longer, you know, through the fall and winter, um, where there might be tensions, but where they are able to get orders enforced. You know, that's a sort of basic level of, uh, you know, of efficacy question, which is if they're able to get the order that they want from the Bureau, are they able to get it enforced? And there are certainly places where that's true um, in periods when the Army is there, and it becomes decreasingly true, or as I suggest, geographically, you know, changed as the Army numbers leave. Exactly. So I think both of those are sort of, at some level, true ideas, right? The Army is resistant. The Army is also somewhat effective. And figuring out exactly when, where, how that interplay works is, is one of the things that I'm trying to, to capture. 
Um, okay, in the uh, back right on the aisle there. Yeah. No, no sorry. Oh, sorry. Behind you. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a, a, a question uh, to Craig Downs again. Uh, with the Freedmen's Bureau agents who welcome uh, the demobilization of the troops but say that more uh, armed force is necessary, uh, do you think they could possibly have been uh, distinguishing the, between white troops from the north and U.S. colored regiments from the south, uh, which uh, recruited in the south, which they didn't think were going to be demobilized? Right. I think that's also a very perceptive question. And certainly some of them, uh, you know, like the Carruthers, um, comes right from that, though he's also reflecting a uh, desire, though he's also reflecting an intense desire among the colored troops who are the 51st USCT who both want to be active agents but also want to go home. So these tensions are real. There's a sort of a, a racial distinction, but then there's also a sort of a level of, uh, of, of tension that, that cuts across the lines. On the other hand, it doesn't break down, at least in what I've been able to do so far, um, neatly on a, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, cheering the white troops going, you know, the, uh, neatly on their reactions being, being generated by racial grounds. And I think what they're pointing to is something that is a, you know, potentially, um, you know, fruitful line of inquiry, which is nobody thinks they need a million people, right? You can believe that, not, you know, whatever number, 80%, 90% should go home and still have a strong occupation. But it's figuring out how to turn that, turn that gap, you know, that dial on and off that's posing the analytic problem. So even, you know, the most robust occupiers, you know, however you want, you know, whatever number you want to pick, you know, 150,000 troops, 200,000 troops, the vast majority of them are still going to be sent home and quickly. But it's how you turn that dial. And that is the question I think that nobody is able to, you know, they sense that both these people, I think, are genuinely conflicted. Both of these are, you know, values, you know, occupy the South and get the troops home. And at some level they're compatible, but only in a very tricky level of analysis that nobody's quite got their, got their handle on in the moment because it's a very complicated question. Okay, over here by the wall. Um, I have a question for Jim Downs. Uh, I'm not a Reconstruction scholar, um, but I've, I've, in the 1930s, um, Marion Cuthbert uh, stands up at the NAACP national meeting and says, okay, we're not extinct, so we got to, America's got to deal with us. And it's, I was surprised in the 1930s that that would still be a viable idea that she felt like she needed to, to put down. So I guess this extinction model goes, goes longer. And, and then the other comment I had was just that you might look a little bit at contemporary discussions of South Africa, because there's this real strong sense that AIDS was something that was created by whites to destroy the post-apartheid world, you know, and, and, and there's this, and, and it is just incredibly horrible that AIDS crisis came immediately after the fall of apartheid, because there is this mass death right after a, a similar kind of emancipation. So I think that the 1930s comment when she makes it is more, is probably coming out more of a eugenics discourse. And, but I would argue that one of the things that I'm trying to do is to argue that the eugenics discourse that develops in the last decade of the 19th century and really sort of reaches a crescendo in the second decade of the 20th century results in large part, you know, we always thought based on a sort of medical fiction about black bodies and it, it, it was necessary to marshal um, a scientific discourse to explain segregation and discrimination. And my sense is that people in the early part of the, of the 20th century were aware, because of Dunning, of the fact that there was a massive um, mortality among people. So that what my work is trying to do is say that the extinction discourse that grows out of eugenics doesn't, in fact, come out of like the air. <laughs> Right. It's actually probably grounded, more than likely, in what people saw during Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And they witnessed this high death um, mortality. And then the thing about AIDS is really fascinating, and I would love to talk to you about it later, because there's a whole other, I think it's analogous in a lot of ways. OK, over here. Okay, well, this is for uh, both uh, Kate and Craig. I think in some ways, uh, the problem with the uh, photosynthesis and uh, just to start, to start out or be there, is not with the South, where we seem to be uh, building and modifying and extending, but with its characterization of the North, uh, where I think his book is at its weakest. And it relates in, in uh, 
comes back to the questions that you've raised, why, why there weren't sufficient number of troops. And, and you started this uh, questioning tape here. Uh, comments that it's not retrenchment. I mean, the North is willing to spend in areas like internal improvements and rivers and harbors and railroads and others, massive, massive amounts of sums. It's not even in the use of troops because the troops get redeployed. They get re redeployed to the West. They get redeployed to the cities. So they keep a lot of men in arms. But it's more that the Republican Party both before and after the war, really doesn't have a profound interest in the well-being of African Americans. And that both before and after the war, their real interest is in a very narrow legal definition. I mean, obviously, it's of great freedom. I won't minimize it, but of great importance. But it's limited. And then after the war, you know, it continued. The mainstream of the Republican Party is really no more doesn't want to go beyond narrow legal equality. And they're forced to for a brief period of time. But if you look at the debates, they're very uncomfortable with that. And then they immediately pull back so that you know, the real issue you know, and the answers, I'd suggest, lie in the heart of what makes up the Republicans. I think that's a great question. And I think that you know, the field would benefit by, you know, and there are some works out there that are doing it, you know, by a sort of statement of that, you know, so that people could really uh, engage in complex terms with that. Um, I would, you know, welcome it because I think that there's a lot to disagree with, you know, respectfully about that as the sort of driving impetus. For one thing, I think that when we think about efficacy and force, we have to be really careful about a flattening. Um, so that there's an easy way in which they say they sent the troops to the West or they sent the troops to Chicago. Um, but this totally misses the sense of what the numbers at play are, right? Um, they cut the, you know, the, the, the numbers of troops they sent to the West. Yes, the army that exists is sent to the West. The army that exists, though, is on a constant downward squeezing pressure. There is no voice um, that is saying, let's, you know, bulk up the army to send to the West. We won't, re you know, expand it to send to the South. We'll expand it to send to the West. Sherman, from day one in St. Louis, is writing to say, we can't do anything. And so this term that exists in the historiography of South to West, doesn't engage with actually how weak that term was and how it's really not a term from south to west. No one is able to enforce anything in the west. Sherman is talking about, forget about you know, controlling the Indians. I can't control the settlers. And he's pushing for more and more. And the Democrats, once they take control of Congress, are pushing for it to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So yes, there are these interesting sporadic places where troops are sent to the west and the north. But I think this shift of the force goes from the south to the west misses the big picture, which is the force disintegrates. And that is true when we think about the interesting work going out of the West, of how much more that tells us about what that Western historiography is doing, which is the disintegration of federal force in the, in the territories even where there is constitutional authority, um, not a sort of clear-cut story of you know, the federal, you know, federal government marching in and able to impose what it wants. The second thing that I think the analysis has to engage with is the Democrats. And so an argument that we know what we got, um, that the Republicans therefore must have wanted what they got, I think falls on two levels. One of which is what I said before, which is um, that I don't believe that you know conscious intelligence works that highly, even for you know scholars of 19th, even for scholars of 19th century U.S. I think people all the time misunderstand what's coming. They all the time don't understand the implications of their actions. If you're you know curious about this, I'll be glad to you know give you the names of several family members who will tell you that this is true for Greg Downs. So uh, to me, I think we have to sort of treat them in some ways as more human, not as ideological standpoints that we can work backwards from what happened to presume their intentions. But the second thing is then we have to place politics in the mix. And Republicans are not just fighting with each other, but they're fighting with Democrats. And the Democrats are getting more and more robust. And there may be a separate argument about the sort of a more general northern um, or as increasingly northern and western public opinion and the way that's going to play in through Democrats. But a lot of that is going to play in, into politics. But a lot of that is going to play in not by exposing the deep laid, early laid um, contradictions of the Republicans, but by the fact that they're starting to lose elections and by 1874 they get massacred.